uh, go to the Lord in prayer, prepare our hearts to uh, hear the word as we, uh, um, I would say, continue the study in, in 1 John, but we haven't actually got there yet. Uh, we're hopeful to get there today uh, since that's the intent, but let's take a few moments uh, to prepare our hearts to uh, hear the word. Most loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of meeting together uh, in fellowship to uh, hear the word. We pray that you will loose the Holy Spirit into our our hearts, into our lives, that we might be able to not only hear the word but apply it, become doers of your word and not just hearers only. Um, Forgive us where we have sinned. Restore us to uh, uh, the righteousness and the fellowship within you, and we will um, bless your name here. We will glorify you and be a part of the uh, ministry that you would have for the, your, your redemptive plan for mankind. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, as we, um, as we continue, uh, just a brief summary of what we dealt with last week uh, uh, very quickly. Actually, it wasn't very quickly, but it was uh, um, actually extensively. We talked about the difference between evil and good, uh, some, some tests uh, that, that might be able to uh, assist in that way. And then we started in on um, uh, to knowing the Apostle John, the author of the first epistle of, of John. We got to uh, my critique of da Vinci um, and ecclesiastical uh, art that typically portrays John as uh, effeminate, uh, unbearded, um, some, somewhat androgynous in many cases. Um, the... Uh, 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 that does not jive with uh, my personal um, uh, perspective of what uh, this particular son of thunder uh, would have uh, appeared like, um, uh, neither in physical appearance nor in uh, perceived demeanor. Now, my wife uh, watches a show, and she's going to have to help me out here because I don't know the title of it because I do not watch it uh, with her. I, I acquiesce to watch a few shows uh, with her, this is not among them, um, but it is a ongoing series apparently of the life of Christ and uh, and his apostles. Um, what what is it? The, the chosen. Yes, yeah, she. I, I I do I do not watch that. Um, no, that's 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 that's, that's not in my my repertoire. Um, I did, however, watch an interview with the director. Uh, and the um, uh, the uh, actor who plays uh, Jesus in that show, and I found that interview to be you know quite fascinating. But my wife, after Sunday school last week, told me that uh, apparently they do not portray the Apostle John in the Chosen as effeminate, um, fi- with feminine qualities. That that they they portray him more. Uh, in line with uh, what we would think as a, uh, a very uh, brash, bold uh, fisherman. Um, and I don't know, again, I don't know if that's true. I'm taking uh, the, uh, the cinematic critique of my wife at, at face value there. But I think that would be more, um, I think that would be more in line with my, pers- my perspective of it. Um, not that I would critique uh, Da Vinci, but I did. Um, we talk, we'll talk a little bit more about... Um, uh, him, uh, John, in, in the book of First uh, John, uh, separating uh, truth from lies. He does call people liars. Those who lie are liars, and he calls it out, okay? Um, there are um, uh, many phrases uh, that you could attribute to, uh, to John. Uh, you could say he calls balls and strikes. There's only two types of pitches in baseball, balls and strikes. You might say that there's an illegal pitch. There is not really. An illegal pitch is a no pitch, okay? There's either a ball or a strike, and he is uh, bold to call balls and strikes. Some would say he tells it like it is, and he definitely tells it like it is. So he separates light from darkness, truth from lies, loving the Father versus loving the world. He differentiates clearly between Christ likeness and antichrist likeness he separates love from fear he 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 celebrates love over hatred he clearly defines eternal life 
versus eternal death separation uh, from fellowship with God. He talks about children of God and children of the devil. And he talks about having life and not having life. So who, what well, a little bit more about this Apostle John who calls balls and strikes. He's known as one of the three most intimate apostles, along with Peter is one and James, likely his older brother James, okay? And you say, how, how do we know that it's his older brother? Well, in the literature, uh, James is always mentioned first, okay? That's why the, the theory is that James... Uh, the brother of John would be, have been the, the elder brother in this case. He was there present at three events that not everybody got to, uh, got to attend. Let's look at one of them. If you'll turn to Luke 8. And we're going to be on the back side of this chapter. Luke 8, we'll start in verse 49. While he was still speaking, someone came from the synagogue leader's house and said, your daughter is dead. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Who's the teacher? Jesus. When Jesus heard it, he answered him, don't be afraid, only believe and she will be saved. After he came to the house, he let no one enter with him except for Peter, John, James, and the child's father and mother. Everyone was crying and mourning for her, but he said, stop crying, but she is not dead. She is asleep. So three apostles were brought in for the witness, the direct eyewitness of that particular miracle that was about to happen with Jairus' daughter. Let's look at Matthew chapter 26. And you probably already know what, what this is going to be about. That deep into the, the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 26, we'll look at verse 36. We take you to the Garden of Gethsemane. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he told the disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray, taking along Peter... And the two sons of Zebedee. So an eyewitness to the agony of Christ in Gethsemane, John was privy to that, an eyewitness. He was, he was brought along along with only two of the other apostles. There's another circumstance where he was privileged to see something not everybody would see. Anybody want to guess this one at this point? Yeah, well, when he, when he, when he, after resurrection, uh, yeah, and, and everybody, everybody saw him, you know, at, at, at that point. Uh, we'll look at the transfiguration, Matthew chapter 17. Something I don't think we actually teach enough on, maybe that'll be something uh, for a later time, is the, the, the transfiguration. Yeah, it is, it is, it is, by literature we assume that James would be, now, not James, the brother of Jesus, but James, the apostle, the son of Zebedee, the, the son of thunder, would be the older brother. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Their, their, their parents were Zebedee and Salome. Okay. So in Matthew chapter 17, we'll start in verse 1. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and his brother John. See that? and his brother John, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. He was transfigured in front of them, and his face shone like the sun. His clothes became as white as the light. Suddenly Moses and Elijah appeared to them talking with him. Holy mackerel. I mean, is that not something? Is Judas there? No indication. Okay. Matthew there? No indication, yes. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, yeah. Oh, no, no. This, this is actually there. This is honest to goodness flesh. And, and we, I hope that we can get there today because this will be a perfect tie-in to uh, 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 a Gnostic heresy that actually John is addressing in 1 John, uh, that, that uh, all of this is uh, phantasmic. It's just visionary, okay? And that, yes, that heresy actually existed in the first century in the early church. So, uh, yes, this is physically happening, okay? Um, in fact, I'll just preview a, a part of it, and I want you to understand that anytime you start talking about uh, uh, the eternal life that is Jesus Christ and attempting to use a mathematical type metaphor, uh, you, you run into some, some constraints because there ain't enough zeros, you know, uh, to, to, to actually describe, uh, you know, his, his infinity. But if, if Christ was not 100% man, okay, if he was only 97.6% man, that would leave the atoning sacrifice that he did 2.4 percentage points short. And in God's holiness, cannot, cannot happen. It would be an inadequate sacrifice. So we, we are talking about flesh actually happening here. But really the point here was to talk about just the intimacy, the privilege that John had to be present at some things that not everybody was actually present with in Jesus' public ministry, okay? It's just awesome. This guy had access. He had credentials. He had a security badge that would get him into everything, okay? And he writes the, uh, the epistle of 1 John with that degree of authority, okay? So that's something we also know about John, okay? When you hear, when you hear Apostle John, okay, um, sometimes, you know, in ecclesiastical art, they refer to him as St. John the Evangelist, okay? But he's also known because of a, a self-description he writes in the gospel as something else. And what would, anybody know what I'm, I'm driving at here? The one Jesus loved, sometimes John the Beloved, okay? John the Beloved. And we could look at the, the several references uh, that are in there, but, uh, but I think you, you understand that that's how he refers to himself. Now, for me, I take a contrary uh, viewpoint to some commentators who indicate that, that, or they surmise that maybe John didn't actually write the, apostle, the, the gospel of John or the letters of John because he doesn't self-identify here. I think that is the ultimate self-identification, okay, that he calls himself the Beloved, the one who Jesus loved. He did not even wish to use his own name in proximity to the great name of Jesus Christ, okay? Now, so he just says he was loved, okay? And I imagine he would assume, actually, he would, he would have ascribed that to Simon Peter as well. Simon Peter was loved, okay? And if you read through the Gospel of John, which the pastor's been doing uh, some, some uh, really, I think, fantastic work looking at certain elements of the Gospel of John over the last several weeks, uh, you see just how often the apostle uses that word love. But I also think that this is why ecclesiastical art seems to uh, portray him as somewhat effeminate because of this connection with love and femininity, okay? Love is not owned by femininity, okay? Love is owned by God. God is love, okay? And so, yes, he describes himself as the one beloved. Um, some people think he was the youngest apostle, okay? Um, I, I don't know if you're going to find any biblical evidence for, for that, but you, it's a good bet he would have been younger than his brother James, okay? And that just leaves 10 more, uh, you know, to, to, to beat. And, and there's some other uh, context clues that would say some of the other apostles would be um, uh, a little bit older. Um, now, uh, some people will look at lifespan, okay, uh, to say, well, you know, he, he, John was likely the last apostle uh, to, to uh, physically die, okay? Now, the, the, uh, that's one way of looking at it, but I'm not so sure I would look at it that way because 
of the manner of deaths of the other apostles, okay? Their life expectancy from an average standpoint uh, would have been cut short by martyrdom, okay? We also know that he was an early visitor to the empty tomb, was he not? And this is one of my favorite trivia questions in Scripture. Who is faster, Peter or John? John is faster. He outran Peter, okay? Yeah, the, the difference was when Peter got there, what did Peter do? Yeah, you know, plunged on in, okay? Get out of my way. I'm going in. But John beat him to the, uh, to the empty tomb. So once again, he was an eyewitness to something that was just awesome, okay? He was a pillar of the early church. If you look in uh, Galatians, you say, hang on a second. Galatians was authored by who? Paul. But let's look at Galatians chapter 2. We'll start in verse um, 7. Nope, 6. Now from those recognized as important, what they once were makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. They added nothing to me. On the contrary, they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel for the uncircumcised, just as Peter was for the circumcised. Since the one at work in Peter for an apostleship to the circumcised was also at work in me for the Gentiles. When James, Cephas, and John, those recognized as pillars, acknowledged the grace that had been given to me, they gave me the right hand of fellowship to me and Barnabas, agreeing that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. The Apostle Paul, in his church planting ministry to the Gentiles, endorses John as a pillar of the early church, okay? And you would think, you know, in the 1980s, this would kind of be a no-duh type of statement. I mean, he writes a gospel, okay? He is given the revelation uh, that we, we, you know, went through from the pulpit for, for, for several months, okay? Um, he ministers... In Jerusalem, okay, until around 70 A.D., which is when something happened. What happened in 70 A.D.? The temple was destroyed. The revolt of, of the Jewish people was put down, okay, and, and, the, and the actual the hub of the church moved, okay? The early church hub moved from Jerusalem to places like Antioch and to... Alexandria, and to Rome. So the church was dispersed in terms of its, of its, its kind of hub at that point. And John was a part of that, and John is also said to have left Jerusalem and taken up residence likely at Ephesus, okay? So, but he was a pillar of the early church, as testified to by Paul. Now, it's a very interesting passage of scripture uh, when you look at, go on further with, with, with the discussions that were had there between Peter and, and Paul, but that's another topic for another time. He was the last living apostle, and it was actually rumored in the early church that he would not die. Did you know that? Yeah, it was rumored that he would not die. Others were, you know, uh, very certain to be martyred, okay, but it was rumored among the early church that he would not die. Let's look um, at John chapter 21. Pretty sure that's the last chapter of John, isn't it? And I'm wrong. Nope. Oh, I'm in Acts. Yeah, 21 should be the last chapter. And I can't get there. Uh, yep, 1501 or 1707, um, we'll do it for you. Um, uh, chapter 21, we'll look at, uh, 
Wow, we're talking about really the last portion of it. Um, let's look at um, starting in 2120, verse 20. So Peter turned around and saw the disciple Jesus loved. Who's that? John, following them. The one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper had leaned back. Remember that. Hold on to that. Um, and asked, Lord, who is the one that's going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said, Jesus, Lord, what about him? Jesus said, if I want him to remain until I come, Jesus answered, what is that to you? As for you, follow me. So this rumor spread to the brothers and the sisters that this disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not tell him that he would not die. But if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? This is Christ's incredible way of telling Simon Peter, mind your own business. Okay, Mind your own business. But you can see how this rumor gets started that John would never die. Okay, Now, I'm... I mentioned that I might share with you a little bit of the story of why you see John actually portrayed with a chalice of wine in a lot of the ecclesiastical art, and I'll get, get there in a moment. But there's another legend, and I want to make very clear here, this is extra biblical. This is not in Scripture. It's written by some of the early historians of the church. It is not accepted as canon in Scripture, okay? Tertullian is one of them. He wrote a story about John that, uh, before the Romans actually banished him, exiled him, he was brought into the Colosseum in Rome, and he was dunked in a vo boiling vat of oil, okay? And he emerged from that vat of oil unharmed, okay? And all in the Colosseum bore witness to this, and many were saved that day, okay? Okay? Whether that's legend or actually occurred and not recorded in Scripture, I don't, I don't know, but that, is, that will tell you a little bit about how the Apostle John was viewed in the, the earliest part of this millennia. Okay? So let's talk about the chalice just a moment. Um, there is something um, among uh, some of the, uh, and, and I'm going to get this wrong, it, it could be the Catholic Church, it could be the Eastern Orthodox Church, I, I, it might even be the Anglican Church, I don't know. Okay, somebody will have to look it up, but it's called the Feast of St. John, uh, which is celebrated on uh, December 27th. But the reason that you see um, John in ecclesiastical art often portrayed with a chalice of wine, sometimes with a dragon's head coming out of it, sometimes with a snake coming out of it, is this. This is also extra-biblical. You do not find uh, this particular story in Scripture. Um, but it's John the Evangelist is depicted holding a chalice. This is an allusion to him being put to the test by the high priest of the Temple of Diana at Ephesus. I mentioned that he was at, at Ephesus. In Ephesus, there was the Temple to Artemis, also known as Diana, Okay, depending on whether you like Greek or Roman mythology at this point, which pantheon you, 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 know, you grew up with at this point. Uh, that temple, ironically, is known as the, one of the seventh, seven wonders of the world. Last weekend, I will tell you, I found an eighth wonder. It's at Dairy Queen for a limited time. It's the, ex, it's the extreme Reese's blizzard, okay? It will change your life. It will improve your mood. It will restore broken relationships, I promise you. It is incredible. I know where I'm going this afternoon. Well, the high priest said to John, high priest of, 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 at the temple of Artemis of Diana, if you believe in your God, I'm going to give you some poison to drink. And if it doesn't harm you, it means that your God is the true God. So the pictures that you see um, depicted in ecclesiastical art of John holding the chalice with a, a snake coming out of it, sometimes a green snake, sometimes a dragon's head, is uh, indicative of this, uh, this legend that he blessed, the, he asked blessing upon this particular wine, and the, um, the sin within it, the poison within it, came out, and that he was able to drink it and um, demonstrate that, uh, that, that, that uh, our God is the true God. So that's the legend uh, um, there. It also, uh, uh, some people will link it to that, that story of... Um, when Christ asks, are you worthy to drink of the cup that, that I drink from? But that's why you see that. So we now know a little bit about um, the apostle that wrote the, the, the first epistle of John. 
Um, and I, I just, I'm going to have to stop saying that because it makes me chuckle every time I do. Uh, yes, John wrote John. Okay, we'll, we'll get that straight. Um, so when was the letter written? Okay, and this is a matter of some theological debate. Um, I don't, for personally, um, I don't find a whole lot of evidence for anything other than the late first century. In other words, in, somewhere in the 90s. Uh, not, not the 1990s, the actual 90s. Okay, uh, to me, that I think all the evidence really points to that. There will be some that say that it could have actually been written uh, during the Jewish rebellion. I don't find a whole lot of, of, of compelling evidence for that. Um, but a lot of people link the writing of first, the first John to the writing of the gospel. They try to use context clues between these books to try to isolate when it was, when it was written. I think, to be, to be quite honest with you, the fact that it was written, that it is the inherent and in, in, in inerrant word of God is, is enough. But I subscribe to the belief that it was written at the last part of the first century um, before the revelation and after the gospel of John. Um, some people will say it was written from Patmos. Others will say it was written from Ephesus. Personally, I think it was written from Ephesus as he was ministering there. Okay, um, You know where Ephesus is, just so we're clear? That's, you know, it would be... Uh, very close to the Greek um, Turkish border, okay, and it was the center for commerce and culture in in, in Asia Minor at that time. Uh, one of the reasons that I believe that it would have been written in the late uh, the later part of of the first century is it is that First John is a direct refutation of Gnosticism, and Gnosticism was just beginning to appear in the early church at this point. Paul's letters when it was exposing error, was a lot of times exposing the error of legalism, okay? First John exposes not just the error of legalism, there's a little bit of touch on that, but it's mainly against Gnosticism, okay? This, this notion that you must have secret gnosis, secret knowledge, and that is what saves, not the sacrifice and acceptance of Lord Jesus Christ, okay? The Gnostics would claim that Jesus... He's cool. He came to reveal his own personal gnosis, his own personal knowledge. But in, in many ways, they denied either his deity or his humanity. And in doing so, they denied his perfect sacrifice. Some will say he was a prolonged theophany. Okay, It was just a prolonged vision that people thought they saw. Okay, They were endowed with some type of common vision of... of, of non-incarnate, but, but revealed uh, theophanic, that's not a word, God, okay? Um, some said that he only became God at his baptism, okay? But when, 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 the, when the Spirit came upon him uh, at his baptism, that, that that's when he became God. Folks, if you believe that, that is, that, that is inaccurate, completely inaccurate, okay? His incarnation did begin with the Holy Spirit but it began in the womb of Mary, the virgin. That's when he became incarnate. Some people will say, well, hang on, he doesn't mention, you know, in 1 John, he doesn't mention anything about the persecution of, of Domitian, which dates to 95 AD. Big deal. He ain't writing about persecution at this point. He's writing about error among the, uh, the church and how to know it, expose it, and get it out. So who was the letter written to? I mentioned yet, uh, last week that it was written to the family. This letter was written to the family. And if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you've accepted him as your personal Lord and Savior, this letter is just as much to you as it was to the church at Ephesus or, or Philippi or Thessalonica or any of that. Okay, That's who it was written to. Is there implication for the unbeliever? Absolutely. There is implication, as all Scripture has implication, and can be used uh, for evangelical purposes for the unbeliever, but it was truly written for the believer, okay? And a lot of people believe, as I do, that this letter was probably circular in nature and might have made the exact same rounds as you see to the seven churches that he describes in the book of Revelation, okay? He was up there ministering at Ephesus, and he had tremendous love for the early church. So I can already see that I'm not going to get anywhere near where I want to go. But we're going to get, uh, let's at least get the purpose 
uh, purpose statements out. But before we, before we get there, I want to look at the purpose of the, apostle, the, the gospel of John. Okay, Let's look at the purpose of the gospel of John. And we're, usually, if you were, if you were um, uh, trained by a modern English professor or an English teacher in the, um, in the five-paragraph um, writing assignment that you can apparently distill everything into, where would you find your purpose statement? It would be in your the last sentence of your introduction, right? Yeah, that's your that's your purpose statement. Not the way John writes, folks. <laughs> John did not. He was not subject to either the public or private educational system that we have in modern America. If you want to see the purpose statement of John's gospel, we've got to go to John chapter 20, which we already learned 21 just a few minutes ago is the last chapter. So you see his purpose is in John chapter 20 and in the latter portion of John chapter 20. In fact, in my, in my translation, this is subheaded, the purpose of this gospel. There's a clue. There's a clue there. So John chapter 20, verse 30. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That's the purpose of the gospel of John. So what about the purpose of the first epistle of John? And here we'll have to uh, suffice to say there are multiple purposes in the epistle of First John. The first one I think we find is a really good place to find it because maybe he was um, starting to preview what the old five-paragraph thesis statement uh, thing is because it is in the last sentence of the prologue, okay? 1 John 1, verse 4, we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. He is writing these things. What you're about to read is written so that your joy may be complete. Some of your translations say perfected. Some might say perfected. Some of them might say uh, uh, fullness, not partial joy, not a hint of joy, all joy, perfect joy, complete joy. Okay. Now let's look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. You get another purpose. My little children, I am writing you these things so that you may not sin. Complete joy, full joy, perfected joy in fellowship. And then to know and be able to refrain from sinning. Purpose number two. That was 1 John 2, verse 1. 1 John 2, verse 1. My little children, I'm writing to you these things so that you may not sin. And by the way, that my little children is one of the reasons, and you see his, his terms of endearment for the people that he's writing to. It's one of the reasons why I believe that he's been in Ephesus for a while. It's one of the reasons why I don't believe this was written uh, in the, 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 the 60s, the real 60s. Okay? Um, I believe it was written later. He has terms of endearment for these people, okay? like my little children. And then we'll look at 1 John 5. Verse 13, and this is what I hope, my hope is, you will grasp onto. Because now, now he goes back to the standard that he sets in his gospel, okay, with, with revealing a purpose statement. Because this is towards the end of the book. Chapter 5, verse 13, I have written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. He's writing this so that you and I can have the blessed assurance of our salvation. So there's at least three purposes in there, okay? To experience the joy, the fullness, the complete joy of being in fellowship with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and your Christian fellowship to refrain refrain from sinful practices, and to know that our eternal destiny 
is with the everlasting life that is Jesus Christ. Some commentators will point to five purposes that he has in writing, but that's because this, this particular book almost defies outlining. I would love to go back to Ms. Dawson, my sixth grade English teacher, and say, you know all those things you had me outline? Do we even still do that, those of you? No, you need to investigate this curriculum now. Come on. Yeah, just getting into that? Yeah. yeah. Oh, diagramming sentences. Oh, yes, that's punitive. That is, that is punitive stuff right there. Yeah, they still do it. Well, good. They should be doing it. Ha, ha, because I don't have to anymore. Um, but how many, I mean, y'all remember having to read through sections and outline it? I'd love to give Ms. Dawson First John. Give her First John say, outline this. Give this a shot, okay? Because um, I have seen it outlined in, with two major premises. I've seen it outlined with three major premises. I've seen it outlined with five major premises. I've seen it outlined with as many as eight plus the prologue, okay? If there's that level of disagreement, there's no way, no way she could say I got it right or wrong, okay? She'd still give me a grade, but that's the way it would be. I'd love to do this. Um, the, 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 the other thing I want to point out here is that you're going to see a lot of positivity, a lot of love in, in the, the epistle of 1 John. You're also going to see a lot of negative positions, and I don't mean negative from a standpoint of uh, a negative person, okay? You're going to see how to find error, okay, in there. So there, there's an exposure of, of error. It's a challenge to the church to avoid the, teaching, the, the teachings of heresy that steal Christian joy, that make us insecure in our eternal security as a believer, leave us living in doubt and stifling the boldness with which we are to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. So we see all of this in there. But we see it from the apostle of love. And in a couple of weeks, um, on a, I think August 8th, Matt begins a, a Wednesday night session on uh, apologetics, okay? And the, um, the real cool thing about that, the thing that I struggle with the most, is the ending portion of, of, of that, 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 that mission for us, which is to do this defense, but do it with gentleness, okay? Gen- gentleness is not something that comes naturally to me. Okay, I am not the kinder, gentler Doherty, <laughs> um, and and you know that that's something that I that I pray for and, and and attempt to work on. But but gentleness does not necessarily mean meekness. Gentleness can mean being direct, but from a standpoint of love, and the love that John exposes here for the early church that was being challenged by heresy is amazing, okay? If you believe that this was written in the 90s, as, as I do, you're looking at a man that would have been in his 80s, potentially. In his 80s, still ministering, still ministering boldly, okay? Still having tremendous eternal impact with the work that he was doing, okay? So 1 John is bold. It is unambiguous, and it's delivered from an outpouring of love and urgent urgency, okay? We'll look at the organization of the book as we get into the prologue next week, but I'm going to challenge you to do something this week um, to, uh, to, to, to kind of whet your appetite as we get into 1 John 1, uh, verses 1 through 4, okay? Um, how many of you can re- remember reading a book, probably you were forced to read it, that had an incredible first sentence, a first sentence that you remember to this day? Anybody? It was the best of times, it was the worst of times, and that is Charles Dickens' Tale of Two Cities, right? Yeah, okay. How about this one? Call me Ishmael. (laughs) Herman Melville, Moby Dick. Let me give you a few other ones. It was a bright, cold day in April, 
and the clocks were striking 13. Oh, now. George Orwell's 1984. How about this one? This is a layup for you. This is, did, did he have it? He just didn't say it? Oh, okay. Yeah, I have a lot of books that I don't read. But um, um, <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, how about this? This is a layup for you. You don't know about me without you have read a book by the name of The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. But that ain't no matter. Mark Twain, that's The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. Okay. Um, in my younger and more vulnerable years, my father gave me some advice that I've been turning over in my mind ever since. East Egg, West Egg, that's the great Gatsby, F. Scott Fitzgerald. Okay. Um, for those of you who are more into romance, here's one for you. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. Anybody? Oh, you heard it. I know some of you have heard it. Some of you are saying, I've seen the movie. <laughs> I've seen the remake. Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. Folks, I challenge you this week to read the first sentence, maybe the first two of First John, and also take a look at some of the um, amazing first verses of the books of the Bible. Of course, I mean, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, okay, in Genesis. But for my money, there is nothing that hits you right in the mouth like the introduction of First John and the introduction of the gospel of John. We're talking right to the point, let's get it on, is what this apostle is saying. So I challenge you to, 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 to read that, and then I'll share with you this, because you, you know this already. I'm, I'm not a normal bird by any stretch of the imagination. I was not a normal leader of, of sales teams. Okay? I was not a normal change agent in operations or, or marketing or, or any, I'm not normal at all. Okay, I was told by a lot of, of my, my you know, supervisors in the past, you better keep putting good performance numbers on the board because you don't look like somebody that should be here. You don't act like somebody that should be here. So you better keep putting good performance numbers on the board. So um, I did not do it in 2021, but for the past three years before that, I've challenged my sales team to participate in an activity called the Bulwer Litton contest. I've actually uh, put my submissions in every year since 2014. Now you probably don't know who Bulwer Lytton is, but he was the author of the book that um, began, It Was a Dark and Stormy Night. You remember that one? Okay, well there is a contest, okay, that's been going on since 1982 that you can craft the first sentence of a fictional fiction book, okay, and send it in and it will be judged, okay, to see is it intriguing enough for people to actually want to read the rest of your fictitious book, okay. I have not won. I am, I have not even placed honorable mention in the, in this contest, but look it up as the Bulwer Lytton contest, okay, but what I challenge my sales team to do each year, each as individuals, is to write the first sentence of the story that they wish their career, their life would have in this year. Right now it's fiction because it hasn't happened yet. Okay? And lo and behold, they, they didn't learn this until the second year. About July, I'd come back around and present that sentence right back to them and say, how's your story going? How's your story going? Okay, and then in December during year-end reviews, it would be a part of the year-end review. Have you written the last chapter of your story? How are you doing? Okay, well, here's the difference. The bulwer Lytton contest is about fiction. It's fiction. The first sentences 
to these books, the middle sentences, the last sentences are the inspired word of God. It is not just not fiction. It is divine truth revealed, okay? So um, I've actually thought about lifting one of the, uh, the verses and, and sending it in as if it's, you know, see if I could win with that, right? Maybe a little bit of larceny would, would help me win, win the contest or something like that. But um, if you're so inclined, if you have a creative uh, mind, if you, um, uh, if, if you fancy yourself as an aspiring writer, maybe check that out. See, see what you can get going there. But uh, my challenge for you this week is to read uh, the, the intro to, to 1 John and uh, also to, to John, uh, I think that would be instructive as well. And then maybe we can, we can see what you come up with by way of other intros to books of the Bible uh, that, that just absolutely, you know, pin your feet to the floor because you, you, you got to know what comes next. Any questions, comments, announcements, assertions? Yeah, no doubt. In fact, that's where I wanted to get next week. I'm not going to get there. It'll be two weeks from now. It's fellowship. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, 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 a, and a different perspective of fellowship, okay? And you need to make sure you're here for, you know, next week I'd love for you to be here, but the following week when we get to fellowship, I think we'll get there. This is where I'm looking for homemade ice cream. I think I have isolated it um, to both, uh, you know, that, that this is where you're going to find homemade ice cream uh, in Scripture. And pea salad with extra mayo and extra cheese um, and potluck. <laughs> but no, that, but you're right. Fellow, fellowship is absolutely crucial here. But I think sometimes we have a, a modern version of fellowship that isn't exactly aligned with, with, with what John has in mind, you know, with fellowship. Yeah. 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 Okay. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you uh, for... Christ manifested to us in human flesh, perfect sacrifice, perfect provision for us, perfect man, perfect God. We thank you for your divine plan being worked out among us. Help us be a part of that. Loose the Holy Spirit in our lives. We pray a special blessing on the service that is about to follow, whether in, in, in verse or in, in word, we wish to uplift you, glorify you, for it's in Christ's name we pray.